Hi, I'm Ronnie O'Sullivan, and welcome to my new show. Coming up on the first ever Ronnie O'Sullivan Show. <laughs> we'll get tips from the five times world champion in the first instalment of his snooker masterclass. We'll catch up with 2010 world champion and current world number one, Neil Robertson. Plus, we'll look back at the Welsh Open with Ronnie's record-breaking maximum. And there's a chat with one of snooker's rising stars, Joel Walker. Ronnie O'Sullivan has dominated snooker in 2014. His Welsh Open title just three weeks ago was his 26th ranking title of his career, and the 147 in the final frame took him beyond Stephen Hendry's all-time record. It was his performance at the Masters back in January that produced the biggest plaudits of all, with many describing it as snooker from the gods. Good friend Andy Goldstein caught up with Ronnie at his flat to get his thoughts on that incredible display. Brilliant, brilliant start to the new calendar year, if you like, 2014. And obviously the Masters is like a huge event for me because it's in London. So it's an event I love playing because there's all the top quality players in there, so you know every match is like a final, really. Um, so to, to manage to win it and win it in the style that I did, which is quite unbelievable, really. You're laughing, aren't you, because you're thinking of that game against Ricky Walden? Well, I'm laughing, really, because not many people know, I mean, um, that two days before the Masters, I was going to pull out um, due to stress and exhaustion. Again, you know, I played so much September, October, November. I tried to play as much as I could. And with the stress of everything going on, um, you know, I just find it, I just was really struggling to be honest with you. And I said to my mate, I just said, you know what, I said, I can't do this no more. I said, I'm not happy, I'm not enjoying it. I feel like I'm a slave to the snooker, I'm travelling, I'm trying to juggle, you know, trying to be a father and, you know, just trying to keep everyone happy, basically. And, uh, and the stress of it all just became all too much, you know, and uh, I just decided then that, I was not going to live the next 10 years how I'd lived the previous five. Maybe it's better I just turn up tomorrow, get beat 6-0, no one needs to know, and then I can just plan my future. You know, I just need to back off of travelling and playing so much and, and just need to just get control of my life again because it was just like everything was spiralling out of control. And it's another big, big victory for the Rocket. Far from losing in the first round, Ronnie eased past Robert Milkins to set up a quarter-final clash with Ricky Walden. And everything went perfect for you that afternoon. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you aware when it's going on now, you look back, surely even you say, you know what, that was pretty close to perfection? Yeah, well, I haven't really seen the match. All I remember is going into the match thinking, you know, um, tough match. And I remember Ricky starting off with a, a nice break of 30 odd, and I thought, oh, you know, I don't want to get off to a bad start. And all of a sudden, I missed one ball, and bang, I cleared up, and I thought, oh, that's, that's And then after that, there's only probably one kind of one shot I really remember from that match, and that was when I went into the pack and I had this red, and I knew it wasn't an easy red, but it was into the middle, and I thought, yeah, I'm going to go for it. And I remember potting it, and when that went in, I thought, oh, if I'm potting that, mate, there's, there's nothing safe. I was, I was hitting the ball kind of with that much accuracy that, you know, I just felt like, you know, everything I went for or touched was, was just going to go in. Well, what can you do about that? He swerved round the brown. My aim was to try and hit the red kind of full ball, but leave a good white. I wasn't, I wasn't going for the pot, but then when the pot went in and... I just thought, well, that's a bonus. But then the black wasn't easy, so um, I managed to pot the black and I remember breaking the reds up. Uh, so even though you get a fluke, there's still a lot of work to do. Look at that. Look at that. The crowd love it. Well, that's incredible. Just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Of course, you had the final against Mike Selby. You had a great season already up to that moment. Yeah. Um, were you nervous? It's sweet to beat him because he's obviously got so a great tough record. to beat. Yeah, but he's got a great record at the Masters. Certain tournaments, certain players find their form. He certainly seems to rise to the occasion. Yeah. He's a big-time player, um, and to play him as someone that has got a good record in the Masters, he was the reigning champion. For me, coming in. Obviously, as world champion, but haven't played much for the season. I was like 30, 30 odd ranked in the, in the in the rankings. So I was playing like the top guy, 
and it was like, I was just enjoying the challenge, I was enjoying the buzz, and I thought, these are the guys that are meant to be winning the world titles. This is like, this is, these are the best that snooker's got to offer, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm competing with them. And uh, I was disappointed though when I missed the brown on 8-1, that was to go 9-1, yeah. because I'd have liked to have got to nine, maybe seen if I could have won 10-1, but as soon as I missed that shot, I could just feel it that he was like thinking, oh, he's missed it, I fancy this. I remember that's a brown off the spot as well. Well, that is unbelievable. It was just one of them shots that, you know, I'd, I basically I thought it was in, I thought I'd just put the brown, put the yellow green, yeah, he'll I concede, remember. it's game over. Um, and I just remember missing it, and then he cleared up, and then I, I he's like, his, his old demeanour changed. It was like, hold on, he fancied winning the, winning the match. I'm thinking, I'm still 8 to up, but this guy fancies he's going to win the match. And that's, that can sometimes be difficult to play against when you feel like you've played someone off the park, but yet they still feel like they're capable of beating you. Mm. So I kind of had to dig in again and try and find some resolve from somewhere to try and not let him get back to 8-6, because everybody knows that Mark is probably better coming from behind than he is being a front runner. When you're outside of the eight, frame out of that. Like that. Nineteen years after he won this title for the first time, he's won it for a fifth. How long did you get to keep that for? Uh, I think about a couple of months. I think, I think they want this back for the World Championships, so as they'll have this, the Worlds and the UKs on display for the fans in that. But okay. You know, Why don't they let you keep I it? I feel a bit cheated by it. Yeah, you've won five now. I earned, I earned, I'd like six, seven days of playing some great snooker and competing. And like, I've, I remember coming back from a pro-am when I was about 12 and I'd won £600. But they didn't give me a trophy and I got home and I was devastated. I was like, what's the <laughs> what's money? I just, I just wanted a trophy. You know, because I used to look at my trophies and think, yeah, I earned that. So the celebrations can begin for Bonnie O'Sullivan and his family in 2014. He is the Masters champion. After the break, it's back to Newport with Ronnie analysing that 147 in the final. And there's a chat with one of Snooker's rising stars, Joel Walker. Welcome back to the Ronnie O'Sullivan Show. Ronnie's second tournament of 2014, the Welsh Open, proved to be another successful one. He eased through to the final, where he came up against the season's informed player, Ding Jun Wee, who had already won four ranking titles during the campaign. The final was a one-sided affair, but what happened in the last frame was truly special. OK, let's have a look at the frame. Have you seen this before? Since? Yeah, I've watched this a couple of times. People at home may be looking at this thinking there's a red over the hole, it's, yeah. it's quite an easy pot, but it's not about the pot. This was probably one of the hardest shots of the break, to be fair, because it wasn't a dead straight one, and I've had to drag it in, but try not get too much side on it, because if I'd got too much, see, I've hit it in the fat part of the pocket, yeah. which has killed the white a bit and left me on the black. Um, and that worked out really well, because the black was covered by, black spot was covered by the red. thinks about the maximum thank you fine all I was thinking about was just trying to you know win the frame you know I didn't even realize that the maxi was on no you must have done no honestly no I, 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 look, I, I, I thought I'm gonna take this red here um, I've got that one there and then you know I'm I'm, 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 I'm on a 50 break I make three up you know if, if, if the opportunity presents itself to get on to um, another red, then hopefully I'll win it in one visit. No, he just pulls it there. So you, you, you know you're going to hit that full ball? I can't really fail there, because hit that full ball, i got that. If I skim off of it there, I hit that one, that goes towards okay. the middle. Or if I hit that full, you know, I've got that one as well. So now that's, that's yeah. the bad news for you. What, the red going on the cushion? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but, but, but to be honest with you, I didn't even notice it was there. I was, all I was happy about was that I was on a red. I wasn't thinking about... 147s, I was thinking, oh, that's nice, I'm on the red, on the black, and again, I've got the opportunity to go into these reds, and I've got these two here that go into the, to the corner pocket, or I've got the one that goes in the middle. I looked at the scoreboard when I walked around the table here, and I thought, oh, 49, blacks, reds, there's a 147 on here. 
And then I thought, no, nah, don't start thinking maxis, just kind of think of winning the frame. But that was a good shot, because that's hard, reverse side. It's really and again, I mean, is it all about giving yourself options? The snooker players watching the same amateurs, that's, is that key to making a big break? Always play for percentage snooker, well, I've rather? I've tried playing for one ball. And, and I couldn't play. <laughs> I In what way? Because you... you well, because someone commentated on me once, I think it was Ali Carter, and he said, oh, the good thing about Ronnie, that, which is so hard to do, he said he's always leaving himself options, and I never really thought about it. So then when I went back to practice, I thought, well, should I just start playing for one red? And when I was, it, the game became impossible. I thought I'm having to play recovery shots all the time, mm. because you can never be that perfect with every shot. So I always found it easier to think, right, well, I'll play for that area because then I've got two or three reds rather than play for this area where I have to be perfect and, you know. So the title is his. Just a question now, can he finish with a 147? This was a good shot after here, this one here. Like I got into this too well, so I want to come there more. Okay. So I've kind of left myself the angle on this red if you pulls it a bit. See this one here? The natural angle is... For, it's to go away from I want it to be here so as I can come straight back and here. But my angle was that I put the red in there and my white was going over to there. So I had to kind of put a lot of left-hand side on it, screw it off the cushion, through to the gap. Yeah, I've hit this so good. Look at this. I mean, it's just going off. away from the... Yeah. The black. It's I mean, it was perfect. But also, not only that, you had to make sure you left yourself an angle. If you were straight on it, Mm. then you've got even less chance of getting up to that red. Yeah, yeah, the whole point was that if, if I was straight, I, I mean, I can come back here or... But you, I, didn't want to, you didn't want to come back here for that red. No, you didn't want to be here. No. You had to be above the... I wanted to be... The middle pocket. I wanted to be here, really. I yeah. mean, as near as I possibly could, because obviously it's, it's not, it's, you're playing into half a pocket. So this black that I played, I actually tried to sort of drift in, sort of around this area, really. All I was thinking <laughs> was pot the red and just get enough pace on the white so as it comes somewhere down here. <laughs> just to give yourself a chance on that black? Yeah, yeah just get, get me anywhere down here. I didn't care if it's there, 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 here. That's what there, you're thinking? There, I don't care, mate. As long as I've got a shot on the black. Oh, superb. I mean, it just falls plumb on the black, look at it. Yeah. You couldn't have put that anywhere else on the table. Unbelievable, It's giving mate. you the angle to get the... Uh, did you, what's your heart doing there? What are you thinking? Yeah, I start to get excited now. This is when I started to get excited, because up until then, although I took 14 reds, 14 blacks, I still had that difficult red. Now, this was the, the shot that done me. I've sort of, I wanted the white to stop there, really, but it's okay. kind of drifted on a bit, so now I've got to play like a slow sort of drag stun. And as soon as I hit it, I sighed. I was like, oh. Look, it's gone off the... The white got away from me. I was gutted. I thought, I've done all the hard work, and now I've just messed it up on the easy yellow. So my idea was to get it in there, nice bit of side, punch it in, and let it just drift in around here. And I knew as, as long as I got that bit right, these bits just take care of but themselves. It's, I mean, it's such, a, it's such a difficult shot. Not as difficult as the red we just saw, but playing this with the rest, to punch it in, to dig down on the cue ball as well. I mean, I've hit it really good. Yeah. You can see that it's just drifted round. It just glides, doesn't it? It just yeah. glides there. And there, are you thinking now I've done all the hard work? Yeah. Of course, you've got the blue to pink, which is not the easiest ball in the world. The blue, I've got a humongous kick on it. Yeah, the it? kick. Yeah. yeah, the kick helped me, maybe. It's because it's slowed the white down. But well, widen it up a little bit. But here I'm just thinking, lovely. What's that feeling like? Getting oh, down for the last just pure turn. excitement, mate. Just pure excitement. Especially when this goes and I was like, look. Ooh. And then so you got the, the cue in, of course, in that hand, and then you flip it over. Yeah. Brilliant. Sensational. Ronnie O'Sullivan brings the house down with a maximum break to win the title. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, it was good fun, good, good, exciting, you know, I was like buzzing with that. Really. How long does that buzz take you to come down from? Um, you still on it? About 20 minutes, half an hour. <laughs> Is that all? Yeah, as soon as you get back to the hotel, I was like, oh, it's yeah. over now. Another normal day for Ronnie at the office. Yeah, getting ready for the next tournament. It's always about the next tournament. My dad always told me it's, it's history. Whenever I won a tournament, he went, history? Don't even think about it. The next one. I was like, <laughs> so it's in my head that, you know, you, you've got that one done, let's, let's move on. Although Ronnie was the star in Newport, the other big story was the emergence of 19-year-old Joel Walker, who made it through to the quarter-finals, beating Stephen Maguire. Ronnie went along to Sheffield to catch up with Snooker's young star, who he actually picked out of a talent competition four years ago. So how did you feel then after... Um, wow. Before the tournament, if someone had just said, you'll get to the quarters and lose 5-4 to Ding, I'd have snapped someone's yeah. hand off. But yeah. 
Absolutely. But That's looking back on it, you're probably thinking, yeah, I'm oh, feeling oh. a bit disappointed because I had a chance to win. <laughs> Brilliant. A break of 101 has put Joel Walker one frame from causing a massive upset here at the Welsh Open. He's probably been the most consistent player this season, and so I've had a chance of beating him. It's it, well, I've proved to my, I've proved to myself that I can do it. I remember the press asking me. They said, you know, Joel Walker. They know that obviously you won the junior thing. And I said to him, I said, he's a rough diamond. Well, I started playing this game when I was six just because I, I loved it. And to, for now, to be, for it to be my profession, and I've got a chance of winning tournaments and, and showing people what I can do. I mean, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Have you set yourself a target or a long-term goal of where you'd want to be in, say, 10 years' time? Or do, you look, do you look that far ahead or do you just kind of just stay with it as it is? And I, I, try, I try and pro plod along, but obviously I want to be world champion and try and become world number one. I know it, it's going to be hard, but I, f I feel like I'm capable of doing it, else, else I don't think I'll play. Can't miss left-handed. Yeah, but we'll be seeing a lot more, yeah. Hopefully. Yeah, we're playing you in the final soon. That, that would be That'd cool. be nice. That would be That's nice. That's the target. I think yeah. That's the target. Eh? Still to come, a snooker masterclass looking at the basics of the game. Plus, we'll hear from the 2010 world champion, Neil Robertson. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Until Ronnie won the Welsh Open, the season had been dominated by non-British players. Ding Jun Wee won four ranking titles, Marco Fu captured the Australian Open, and Neil Robertson continued to impress, winning two titles, including the UK Championship. The world number one is also closing in on a remarkable century of centuries for the season. Ronnie went to Essex to catch up with the 2010 world champion, the man they call the Thunder from Down Under. So Neil, here we are, uh, two tournaments away from the world championships. We've had a fantastic season. Um, the first question I want to ask you is, is the obvious one, and we've had so many people writing in wanting to know the hundred centuries. Mm. I mean, how has it been? I mean, going through making these big breaks. I mean, to me, it would seem like a bit at the moment a bit of an unwelcome distraction. But I, I want to know how you feel about it. Yeah, it's um, at the start of the season. I started off really well, made a lot of centuries. I think. Um, I 20 odd after the first sort of three events or something like that. So there was already talk of it then. After I won the UK, I was, I was sitting at about 60. So and, and Judd had the record last year of 61. So you know I was definitely well in um, well in range of, of, of making probably you know 80, you know possibly 90. Um, and there have been certain frames where I've got to the last thread and do I possibly play safe or maybe take on the cheeky double in the middle or something and stay on the black and um, and I have lost one or two frames actually this season thinking about the 100 centuries. My dad would love me to, to get 100 hundreds as well, he's sort of keeping track and he's you know telling me how many I've had, sometimes I don't know how many I've had and I get a phone call from him and he's like yeah yeah you got one there you're on you're on 89 now or something and I'm like yeah right dad just let me play, let, let me just do it you know. Don't, you know, people trying to work if you make 2.7 centuries per tournament for the rest of the season, you'll get there or something, you know. So, yeah, to, to, to be the first player to make 100 would, would be a fantastic achievement. And, you know, it, it's always nice being the first player to do something, you know. So I know you had a conversation with Stephen Hendry after you. I think you lost in the UK Championships. Um, Mark Selby. Yeah, you lost to Mark Selby. And I know that you had a conversation with Stephen Hendry in the mm. bar afterwards. And you were saying to him, like, you know, how do you kind of, like, obviously the most prolific break builder the game's ever seen, probably the best player that's ever to play the game. And I know you had a chat to him about break build and you know, what what was what was advice did he have for you? I just talked to him about my thought process when I'm building breaks and um, you know he had a couple of drinks, you know, he's doing the commentary work now so he can you know, he can have a few and, you know he's not playing anymore and he said, well to me your break building sounds amateurish. <laughs> and um, I took it well because I mean you know, he made 700. He's made well over 700, and you know, seven world titles, and, and all the all the rest. So, and then he sort of went into detail about sort of different practice routines, just the way you think about your break building, the, the mindset of clearing the table every visit, not 
make 70 and then just oh, relax. <coughs> and, yeah. and it was also uh, watching yourself in the World Championship last season as well. Um, you know, after I lost, I lost first round to Robert Milkins. Again, I felt I wasn't clinical enough in the balls. I let the match, it, I let the frames go scrappy. I lost seven or eight frames, really scrappy frames in the blue and pink. Again, absolutely hated it. Some players would make 20 where you're making 60 or 70. And I thought, well, you know, if I have to, if I'm ever going to compete with you in, in, in big tournaments, then I have to, I have to be more efficient in the balls. I have to, uh, you know, be, uh, be more clinical. You kind of win the UK Championships this year, obviously off the back of speaking to Stephen Hendry. You've now become like one of eight players to have won the triple. What did that mean to you? To join such an exclusive group was, you know, it was um, very emotional for me because, especially, you know, when. I, I, when I first come over in 98, I was only 16 and I was nowhere near good enough really to, to even be professional at that stage and fell off for two or three times, got back on, came over in 2003. That's just something that just never even would cross my mind in a million years. You know, it was the real sort of sense of satisfaction. I've won all like, the three, you know, the, the, the three majors and uh, yeah, it was, it was absolutely incredible. I would imagine in, you know, just listening to that, that, that kind of knowing where you've been, where you've come, you kind of have a much more of a special appreciation for what you've actually achieved. My appreciation for, for everything I've achieved has, um, you know, never, n never changed. You know, I've, 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 I was probably maybe six months before I, before I came over, uh, I was in the queue at the, the job centre to, to get the, to, to, to be on the dole. You know, I was... Was this back in Australia? Yeah, yeah, back in Australia, about six months before, you know, it's wow. still 2003. Um, I didn't have a job, I, I had no qualifications, I was still really young, so, um, and I just couldn't do it, so I just, I, I turned around, I walked out and I just, I, uh, you know, I've got to give Snooker one more chance, you know, I've got to, I don't want to be like this, you know, so, um, I've always sort of stayed sort of pretty focused and, and um, you know, remember, keep remembering, you know, what it was like before I turned pro, you know, the, the sort of the struggles that I had. So now, triple champion, Masters UK Worlds. For me, you are one of the players that should be focusing on winning more Worlds, more UKs, more Masters. I think you're established now, you're in that bracket, you're the number one player in the world. What I'm interested in now, how are you going to peak at the right times? I, I think that, um, well, in some ways, I think that you're kind of leading the way with how players should, you know, treat themselves with, you know, obviously you do a lot of running and that, and you're, I mean, probably without doubt the fittest player on the tour. Um, it's probably, <laughs> prob probably not, you probably don't have too much competition with, with some of the guys out there, but, um, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of players could, could certainly learn a lot from you in, in terms of the, the fitness, and it's something that I, I have to do. Focusing on the big events, building up towards that, uh, towards the UKs, the Masters and the Worlds, um, combining the, the physical fitness with the practice and making sure you're, you're, you're as fresh, fresh as you can possibly be, um, I think it's something that it's going to be really important. It's been fantastic to talk to you and maybe we meet in Sheffield. Yeah, who final. knows, mate? Who knows? That'd be a night, that'd Opposite be a night. side of the draws, yeah. And then you'll no, come dream. out just before the final. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. That'd be awesome, you. mate. Yeah, yeah nice that's been brilliant. Nice to speak to you. Right, today I'm going to be showing you how I play snooker. There's going to be a few tips in here. Um, we're going to start off with the stance, the grip, getting set up for the shot, and later on we're going to go into some more advanced stuff. But just to start off, I think we're going to start with the basics, which is where to hold the cue and where to put your bridge hand and how to kind of line up the shot, which is the most important part. I normally like to hold the cue here with the flap facing up to the ceiling. Copied that off of Steve Davis when I was a young kid, so I've, I've always stuck with that. As an average, you'd like to kind of keep your hand here so you've got kind of a little bit of a cue overhanging, but not too much, all depending on what type of shot you're going to be playing. And then obviously we're going to be walking into the shot and you obviously leave with your right leg first, which you, we're going to try and keep straight as an anchor. And then the left leg is something that we, you, you naturally would bend and that will help you to get down to the shot parallel. And we want to try and keep this hand all depending on what type of shot we've got to play. But as an average, I kind of like, I like that kind of distance from the ball. But obviously, again, all depending on what type of shot you're going to be playing. If you want more power, then obviously you kind of have a little bit more overhanging. So we're going to start off now by walking into the shot. So I walk into the shot, right leg straight, left leg bent, grip nice and loose, 
And as I come through, I slowly accelerate with the pressure grip there. Now we're going to talk about the bridge hand, which is very, very important. It's all so important to have a stable bridge hand. Anything that's moving or not stable is, is, is not going to be reliable. So I like to always try and get this part of the hand or the, or the hand onto the table. You want to kind of keep it level. And what you want to try and create is a, is a V for your, for your cue hand to, for your cue to go through your thumb and then your finger next to your thumb. And what you want to be able to do is to make it that solid that the, that the cue can go nowhere but along this, this line here. You don't want it going across there, you don't want it going across there, you just want it driving fast and forward through into the shop. I always like to kind of make sure that when I'm addressing the ball, my right forearm is parallel. And what I mean by that is it's not too far there or I'm not too much inside. I kind of think, well, there's a kind of neutral position. And for anyone trying to advance in the game, I always think that's a good kind of something to have in your, as a routine, if you like. So um, kind of bear that in mind. I'm not saying one's right, one's wrong, but this is what actually works for me and I haven't done too bad. <laughs> Next time on The Ronnie O'Sullivan Show, The Rocket talks about last year's World Championship success, he heads to the Sheffield Snooker Academy to meet more of the game's rising stars, plus we'll have the second instalment of Ronnie's Masterclass, which will look at break building. Goodbye for now. Oh.